Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. You are listening to Deeper, your daily Bible study. We are finishing up this week's set of lessons on living the gospel, and the title of today's lesson is Divinity and Humanity Combined. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings to us through this past week as we near the end of this week and of the arrival of your your holy day, the Sabbath. We pray that you would uh, direct our lives and our minds and our hearts to you, and especially in the next 14 minutes or so as we study together. May we understand the message you have for us, but we may we also experience the uh, transformation that you want to take place in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today we're looking at uh, this divinity and humanity combined, uh, really one of the ultimate results or fruits of the gospel being lived out in, in any person's life. We're going to start just by referring to the life of Jesus, you know, as I'm sure all of us uh, are aware of, Jesus often called himself the Son of Man, and the Bible, of course, also identifies him as the Son of God. And so we see in Jesus, uh, through the mystery of the Incarnation, this uh, really unexplainable combining of humanity and divinity in the life of Jesus. Now, it will obviously never be like Jesus in, in all of those ways, but part of the good news of the gospel is that when Christ is living within us, human and divine power can also become united in our lives as well. And that's what we're looking at today, you know, within our human sphere and what is uh, attainable and promised to us, what does it mean for divinity and humanity to be combined in our lives? Um, I'd like to start with a statement from the book Desire of Ages, page 535. And this is um, in the middle of the story about when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And I'm quoting now, Desire of Ages, page 535. Take ye away the stone. Christ could have commanded the stone to remove, and it would have obeyed his voice. He could have bidden the angels who were close by his side to do this. At his bidding, invisible hands would have removed the stone, but it was to be taken away by, div- by human hands. Thus Christ would show that humanity is to cooperate with divinity. What human power can do, divine power is not summoned to do. God does not dispense with man's aid. He strengthens him, cooperating with him as he uses the powers and capabilities given to him. Again, that was from Desire of Ages, page 535. Uh, And we're looking at this from the perspective, again, of what are the promises that God gives to each one of us about what is possible when Christ is living within us, when the gospel is being lived out in our lives. And... um, David, as we continue this discussion here, I know we've planned to go to the uh, book of 2 Peter chapter 1. So let's turn there now and look at a couple of verses that really bring out these promises in very powerful ways. Right. In 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, we're going to read verses 3 and 4. And sometimes if you have the same problem as me, sometimes the Bible pages here at the end kind of get (laughs) together. (laughs) But no, I have it here. 2 Peter 1. Three to four, beautiful promise. According to his, as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be by partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Beautiful verses here that deal with what you just mentioned, that connection, that combining, that divinity, human, you know, human effort and divinity combined. And again, this is, we're not looking at this saying uh, part human effort to save yourself. That's not the point being made. This is what are the results when the, when the person accepts Christ and now they begin living the gospel. And this whole passage, and there's more verses that follow, we'll get to a few of these. This whole passage here in the first chapter of Peter has often been referred to as 
either the ladder of sanctification or the ladder of spiritual growth. And there's good reason for those um, labels. In verse 3, um, it's the knowledge of God that starts us on this journey. Uh, certainly, uh, it, this, this is true for each person that has uh, accepted Christ as their personal Savior. It's a knowledge of what he did for us, what he has done for us, what he is doing for us that starts us down this road. But then you know, it doesn't end there. That's just the first step on this journey. The second step, uh, David, he also read that here um, in verse 4. Mm-hmm. As we continue walking with Christ, now it's our privilege to claim the promises of God. And those promises contain the power of God. And when we claim those promises and then uh, begin acting on them in faith in response to what he's already promised, this is when divine energy and power begins flowing through our lives uh, as Absolutely. we claim his promises. And and then look at what happens next. I mean, verses 5, five 6, 7, and 8, as we continue, really explains what God promises to do in our life as we claim his power. You know, and before you go and read those the next verses, I, I always I wanted to just mention that this verse which speaks, you know, we as you mentioned, God calls us to the knowledge uh, or through the knowledge of him. That's how we start this journey. Uh, there is a high calling from the Lord. He says, call us to glory and virtue. It's, you know, there is a, God wants us to imitate him. I mean, Christ said, you know, if you love me, you know, do what I do, keep my commandments. There is a the desire of the Lord to bring us out, bring us out and lift us up from our life of, you know, misery and, and sin, you know, habit of sin to a life of victory, a life of being a light to the world. And so this is kind of what God is wanting to do. And as you mentioned, you get to know him through his word. You really get to know his promises that in the part where you are not able to do because you are limited by, by human you know, then the Lord grants you the power. It's not about you doing things on your own, but you're depending on the Lord and you submit to his will. That is what the human part really element is about, you know, growing and, and, and having a hold on Christ. And so this is really what allows us to, as verse 4 said, escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, you know, it, God wants us to escape to get out of, you know, our, 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 our jail of sin or prison of sin and really be lifted up and be freed from that bondage. And I'm glad you brought that up, David, because, you know, yesterday we were studying the everlasting gospel in Revelation chapter 14. And part of that first angel's message is that when we have the everlasting gospel, uh, we will live a life that gives glory to God. Here we see it again in Second Peter, talking about... Uh, God is calling us to glory and virtue. And uh, David, you just were explaining too that he also calls us out of something, not only into this experience, but he calls us out of a life lived in, uh, my eyes aren't falling on it, but in in bondage to these lusts and so forth. Isn't that the second angel's message, a warning about the fall of Babylon? That is God calling his people out of, of a destructive experience into a saving experience with Jesus. So uh, some really powerful parallels here between Revelation 14 and and 1 Peter chapter 1. Well, the Bible is connected. You know, I I believe this is what the the beautiful thing about the Word of God is alive. You know, the one passage connects to another and really brings together this harmony that only God through the Holy Spirit and the movement of the Holy Spirit of our people that were chosen by the Lord to write these things can really make it possible to fit very beautifully. And now, as you mentioned, when you have the connection, you have, you're partaking of the living experience of, of, of Christ. You are partaking of his divine nature, uh, which gives us this ability to escape from the corruption of the world. Then uh, I guess the famous, uh, you know, ladder of Peter, that's what was, was happens, right? I mean, and we're going to, I guess, read, read that verse uh, 5 through through 9. I believe that's what you want to sure. get into, right? And, you know, so this is now going to answer the question, what does it mean to give glory to God, to live a life like this? We get uh, some small pictures here. Peter goes on in verse 5, and he says, Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, 
Now, virtue is a word we don't use too much anymore, but it really means vigorous action. So mm -hmm. how do I know if I truly have faith? Well, I'm going to be uh, uh, claiming those promises of God, and I'm going to be working them out in my life. You know, it's going to be evident. Um, and then add mm -hmm. to virtue knowledge. As we do this, our knowledge and understanding of God, his will for our lives, this increases as well. Paul goes on, or sorry, Peter goes on, and to knowledge add temperance. We'll come back to that. To temperance, patience. To patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. You know, David, <clears throat> I think that temperance being in the list, it's right there in the middle of the list. It may be surprising uh, for a lot of people, but uh, this, this self-control, this temperance is uh, a critical aspect yeah, a critical link in the chain of what God wants to do in our lives. And this is something that we can see the power of, of God working in the heart, but also requires the, you know, what, as we, you mentioned at the beginning, <laughs> you know, there's a human part to do, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, if you submit yourself to the Lord, God will give you absolutely victory over, you know, different things where, you are intemperate. Intemperate is, you know, is not just being able to have a, a, a temperate character, you know, just be tame and calm, but it's really in regards to habits, you know, and, and things that you eat. A lot of times it, it's, it deals with your, your habits of, of how you, you know, eat or, or what you take, uh, your drink, whatever it is. And so a lot of times these issue where lots and lots of people have not really overcome it's primarily because they have not accepted the fact that God wants them to be able to be, you know, changed, transformed. And he gives us the, the elements he's promising that we can overcome. You know, we have the ability to overcome. But if I'm not willing, <laughs> if I don't let go of, of, of my taste, you know, preferences that usually are corrupt for the most part, then, you know, I won't see these particularly experience in my life. And if you don't overcome in, you know, any of these, you know, it's really, you're not escaping the last of the world, the flesh. Mm -hmm. There was a gentleman explaining his experience to me once, and he said that he had been a, a Christian uh, pretty much his whole life, gone to church. He was a leader in the church. I think it was a deacon, some other offices, but he never had the power that he knew he should have. And, uh, he, you know, he was telling me that he'd have one persona at church and he would go home and, you know, it just, it wasn't working. And finally he became convicted that, um, he would never overcome some of these things and really advance in his relationship with Jesus until he got rid of certain things in his life. And for him, it was his movies and some music, things like this. Those are, those are aspects of temperance, what we allow into our body. And his testimony to me was that when he got rid of these things, physically removed this stuff, threw it away, got it out of his life, suddenly he had the power in his uh, spiritual walk that he had never had before. And Absolutely. you could just see the excitement in his face here Amen. that for him, this this temperance wrong was the one that he had gotten stuck on. And as soon as mm. he surrendered that to God, uh, you know, God kept pulling him along. Yes, very, it, 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 there's many things, Tim. I mean, you know, the all we struggle with, but definitely with the power of God, we can right. overcome. That's right. Well, here at the end of uh, this passage, Paul says this, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. Here's a promise of God that as uh, you continue this walk with him, as he lives his life in you, and as the power of divinity unites with your, your uh, effort and faith, that it will be beneficial, it will be fruitful through the, the power of Jesus Christ. Well, we're Amen. out of time. Thanks for studying with us today, and we look forward to studying again with you tomorrow. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.